So hello everyone. It's really a, a great pleasure for Guzmão e Labruni to be uh, hosting this webinar today to discuss the impacts of technology in the fashion industry. My name is Vanessa Ribeiro, as you can see in my, on my screen. Uh, I'm a partner here at Guzmão e Labruni in charge of the cyber, cyber law practice and co-headed of the IP litigation. I'm joined today by my colleague, Judge Messias, an attorney from our IP litigation practice, very much passionate about the topic of, of our today's discussion, fashion law, and who has litigated relevant cases in Brazil in this field. Besides, uh, we also have the pleasure to be, to have these guest speakers, these outstanding guest speakers today, who we cannot thank enough for being here. Uh, first of Anastasio Sofrono, a visionary fashion uh, and creative entrepreneur with a strong business uh, proven track record for over 20 years, right, Anastasia? In the international uh, fashion industry and on for development, developing and leveraging innovative approaches, disruptive strategies and digital uh, campaigns for many, many brands. And also Alan Hunt, a UK-based partner at the leading firm Liu Silkin, whose expertise is in uh, drafting and negotiating uh, commercial and technology contracts and development protection and exploitation of intellectual property assets. Most importantly, I would say he's the co-founder of the network for decision makers of luxury lifestyle and premium brand business, The Collective by Luciki. The Collective helps to, to drive commercial understanding and foster valuable uh, relationships by bringing together leading individuals and insights. Uh, I'm a big fan of the collective and do encourage you all to visit their webpage regularly for, for additional insights. And this said, I will turn to, to Anastasia to begin our conversation today. Uh, before that, however, I do encourage you to engage with us by asking questions while we go through the presentation, so we may address them in the last part of this uh, webinar. Uh, all said, Anastasius, thank you so much for joining us, uh, and please enlighten us about the current and very relevant transition in the fashion industry, especially enabled by the, the uh, development of technology we're seeing today. The, the, our audience is all yours. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. I really, really love this great panel of collaborators. It's a pleasure for me to be here with you. And uh, as we will start now with a small presentation that uh, it is available on your Zoom at the moment, which I would like us to connect, I will be able to explain to you a little bit where we come from. First and foremost, let me tell you that I am what we call an analog fashion professional because I started my career in fashion when fashion used to have elites, used to have hierarchies, used to have so many different restrictions. And um, we see that the post pandemic, the whole structure of the fashion industry that was more than a hundred years old is changing. So has fashion really changed forever? Are we going through a phase where eventually we are seeing too many disruptive uh, technologies, different types of attitudes, we see a completely different shift in terms of audiences. At the moment, we see that uh, every, every company we, we see publicized, especially from the luxury sector, are really um, focused into diversification of monetizing the interest of Gen Z on the fashion to commerce. And we see that many brands that were traditionally very stilt and very conservative, they really start to look out a lot into catering to ages that are now are between 16 to 36. So let's go to the next slide and see a little bit how this uh, change happened. So what is fashion? You know, in many cases, as I teach many times in various students on brand management and luxury communication, this is the first question I ask them the first day at school. What is fashion? Traditional fashion used to be the mirror of our society. It's everything we express and everything we want to, to define in our community and our identity through clothing, through makeup, through hair, through the general appearance of our existence. Um, the interesting thing is that fashion at the moment 
again, seems to be mirroring this great change, but now the influence is not anymore strictly coming from the fashion magazines. It doesn't strictly come from the celebrity culture. It doesn't really come from the very tight studios of the fashion designers who at the moment, you know, they really try to capitalize very much on the global zeitgeist of influence than just uh, a new trend on a skirt length or a new print in a, in a garment or a new public technology that might can be applied on luxury streetwear. Now, I would like you to have a very close look at this picture um, and tell me if you guys know when this picture was taken. So dear Vanessa, remind me at the end of my section to give the answer to this question. So when was this picture taken? Who is the lady that we see here? It will be very interesting to find a little twist. So let's go to the next slide. And let's see the classical milestones that really have formed the fashion industry that we know today. So as we said, fashion is the mirror of society. Many political, cultural, uh, financial, social, religious statements happen through the way we dress, through the way we present. So we started in 1911, you know, with the king of all, Paul Poiret, who took the couture and really turned it into fashion editorial. He took the studio uh, outside and tried to, to create a story around his fashion. We move on to 1926 at Coco Chanel Little Black Dress that eventually introduced the contemporary wardrobe of any woman since then. We go quickly to 1947 and to the incredible Christian Dior's new look presentation that really shaped the way we knew fashion is going to be created for the future. And don't forget that Christian Dior was the first couturier who saw such an increased uh, demand for his garments that eventually introduced ready to wear in order to cater to this growing group of American consumers who could not get uh, enough of his garments. We arrived to 1996, Yves Saint Laurent blurs the gender fashion lines. And we, it's the first time that we see the Les Mockings. So we see something that is predominantly men oriented uh, be adopted by women. And we see a completely different type of femininity introduced by Yves Saint Laurent. We arrived to 1976 at Calvin Klein, who is the first designer who sees the potential of luxury denim and puts it on the runway. Denim and jeans, which was predominantly a working class uh, staple of uh, definition. Uh, we moved to 1981 in London with Vivian Westwood that she's presenting the very now famous Parade Collection who became the blueprint for many designers like John Galliano and Alexander McQueen who thrive in the future. We go 1982 to Paris and we see the all black Ray Cavacubo Comte de Garçon collection that really redefined 100% the way we, are, we, we define contemporary garments, which are all black with holes, with no shape, with no specific silhouette. We go to 1988 at Nuccia Prada, that she takes over the leather goods company and introduces ready to wear, and she takes fashion by storm. We go to 1998 to Alexander McQueen's infamous collection, where the audience described from excitement, 35 minutes after the show was over, where robotic uh, uh, machines were spraying paint Shalom Harlow in an in incredible runabout podium. And then we go to 1992 uh, with Mark Jacobs that he's delivering the Grunge collection and the list goes on. Let's go to the next and explain a little bit why did I wanted to use all these milestones because we have a completely new opportunity now because these designers are not anymore the rulers and shakers. And these pivotal moments that we see today are not the ones that really define uh, the market. It's more about the new challenges. How do we merge? digital first avid consumers who get information only from their phones or the digital devices they have no uh, pre-collection or respect let's say for the previous fashion elite and now they want to consume whatever they find available or to their liking and they want to consume it in any way possible predominantly starting with a mobile phone and let's go to the next one and let's see a little bit some statistics you know we see that fashion today is predominantly communicated through smartphones, smartwatches, virtual assistants, social media, the influencer economy, individuals that they have very successful platforms through their social media and they incredibly uh, inspire the way people uh, consume. We have content creators and then we have, of course, live stream engagement, which is pretty much bringing the physical world into the digital sphere. Very much so, you will see that in these numbers, the texting and the chatting, the reading online, the social media, the video content, the movies and the shows, video games, reading print has been completely shrunk and working has been completely shrunk. 
So we see by this great statistics by McKinley and co, that the way we shop fashion today is 90% digital first, physical maybe. And we go to the last, um, pretty much before the last, and we have the introduction of digital. So what is the digital? It's the combination between the physical world and the digital reality. And we see that predominantly e-commerce is taking place through the combination of, of these two uh, um, platforms. So the e-commerce um, seems to be getting stronger when it comes to uh, the digital. The mobile communication seems to be stronger when it comes to digital. The social commerce, of course, is more digital. The physical stores are putting more weight into the digital reality and use the physical store, the physical retail, as content creation and uh, uh, substitute. And then of course, the voice commerce. And let's go to the next. And then of course, are we ready for the present future? I wanted to use this expression of the present future because every moment, every second of the day, we are getting into a much more uh, interactive future, a future that brings the digital reality further than the physical reality and the lines are blurred between. And now, Vanessa, do you think we have a answer about our previous picture? Let's go back to my second slide, please. Okay. So I don't know if the people that are listening and watching us at the moment can tell, but this is uh, Audrey Hedborn uh, from the reincarnation of uh, Breakfast in Tiffany. But of course, this is not a photograph. This is a full on CGI representation and this is the new reality of, of fashion where it's not even needed now to take a photograph it's not even needed to have a previous icon alive you can completely reproduce in a cgi contemporary very uh, sophisticated technology where everyone can be immortal forever so thank you very much that's it for me Wow, thank you, Anastasis. Fantastic, uh, really fantastic insights. Thank you very much for the uh, generosity in sharing in sharing your thoughts. Quite quite impressive. Uh, I turn now to to Alan to indicate which, uh, in his opinion, his view, his experience, are some of the legal issues arising from from this interplay between technology and and fashion. Uh, just please go ahead, Alan, and thank you very thank much you. for joining us. <clears throat> And, and thank you for having me uh, today. It's really wonderful to join. And Anastasius, thank you for sort of setting the scene because I think it is really important actually to set that kind of fashion scene and, and, and history because it does interplay in the, in the way that we're, um, we're all moving. So as we know, there is a lot happening in the fashion tech space and that's you know exciting times for designers, manufacturers, platforms, retailers, and of course, lawyers, um, you know, we're lucky enough to be working in this field and have some wonderful clients. And, you know, from my experience of working with a lot of leading brands, fashion houses, platforms and that sort of thing, you know, obviously we're seeing a lot of change today, which is really being driven from the sort of need to be more socially inclusive, more business responsible, more environmentally aware, you know, on, <clears throat> on the one hand. And of course, on the other hand, in, in a space which is so creative fashion, um, you know, there is this convergence of, you know, technology and creativity sort of explodes in this world. And that's why, you know, to Anastasius's point, we're seeing so much of fashion now really being consumed in the kind of digital or digital kind of space, as opposed to, you know, purely um, physical product. Um, <clears throat> now, a lot of, sort of fashion tech developments as we know kind of I've sort of bucketed them into two two buckets for, for the purpose of, of today so we've got all of the kind of innovative developments in fabric and future materials so that's sort of um, you know the, the future of manufacturing um, all really with a goal to reducing waste and reducing consumption and producing better more sustainable materials um, and then the other the other sort of bucket really is the sort of AI, the NFTs, the wearables, the metaverse. And it's really that kind of bucket that I want to sort of cover um, today. Um, now, you know, I mentioned the metaverse there and the metaverse is incredibly exciting and it's um, incredibly 
uh, complicated at the same time. And actually, for the purpose of today, I didn't want to go into it really in too much detail because I think it warrants a session on its own. Maybe that's something we can think about as a round two because there is a lot to cover there. But my recent experience was sort of dealing with, with a couple of legal deals in the metaverse. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we had the Fashion Awards, which is the kind of global uh, fashion uh, awards where uh, they happen in London at the Royal Albert Hall. And we did a deal between um, Gucci, um, the British Fashion Council, which runs the Fashion Awards, and Roblox. And anyone um, maybe with kids might be familiar with Roblox. Um, it's kind of like a sort of virtual Sims world sort of thing. It's, it's very interesting. It, um, it's a lot of fun. But what we did is we created a red carpet experience. So people arriving on the red carpet at the awards um, were able to kind of walk the red carpet with celebrities. Gucci had sort of made limited edition um, products, which you could buy through Roblox. Anyway, it's all this sort of wonderful, amazing, um, you know, experience. You know, um, the, the other sort of interesting thing that, um, although less relevant to today, but did catch my attention this morning when I was reading about it, is that there is a couple that recently got married in the metaverse, I think maybe a week ago. Um, and basically... They're, they're officially married in the metaverse space, but apparently um, not in the real world, because of course, it's not legally binding to go and get married just in some virtual reality. But anyway, it shows you where this is all going. And the reason I wanted to highlight both of those things, the sort of fashion, fashion awards, buying like Gucci merch, but also maybe getting married, is because we cannot ignore this technology. It is so different, you know, Anastasis's sort of timeline there of key, key fashion um, moments, I am absolutely certain that 2021, 2022, that new line item may be fashion metaverse NFTs um, because it, it really is the way that it's all going. And, you know, in the 1990s, there are many, many prominent figures who said things like, you know, the internet will not have a great impact on society. It's not going to change things. Of course, there are many people saying it would, but you know, the point is, I think we cannot ignore technology and the metaverse and everything that's going on, because if we if we do that, um, brands, we're, you know, retailers, platforms, we're all going to sort of miss the boat. So it really is the way that it's going. So of, the, of those kind of three um, legal points, uh, well, three areas of technology that I wanted to cover, just a reminder, that's AI, wearables and NFTs. Um, I thought I'd just jump into those. So you know, AI really is at the heart of pretty much most of what we're talking about now. It's not new, as we know, um, you've got sort of facial recognition, there's chatbots, um, biometrics, other sort of hosting um, tools. And around, I think studies have sort of shown around 85% of customer interactions are now managed by AI. So, you know, of interest for fashion is, of course, um, all the sort of visual recognition uh, purposes. So you have algorithms, um, which, you know, are basically helping with real time inventory tracking. There might be automated wardrobe planning tools, you know, similar product match solutions. So if you buy, you know, this pair of jeans, you might want to buy, you know, these trainers, that, that kind of technology. And then, of course, you've got all the sort of virtual try-ons and all of that sort of thing. So really at the heart of, of, of you know, AI, it's all about enhancing a customer experience on the one hand, but then getting really meaningful data on the other, which helps to boost sales and it helps to really streamline the supply chain. But the big question, and this is where the law comes into it, is, well, that's all good and well. We're all getting this amazing customer experience, but at what cost? And it's that exchange really of data uh, for that wonderful streamlined experience that is really sort of, of you know driving a lot of questions and a lot of concern around AI. Um, <clears throat> so if we just look at what you know some of those data, some of those data issues, um, you know, in the EU and, and sort of around the world, you know, there aren't a huge amount of concrete regulation around AI at the moment. We have all, um, of course, fairly familiar now with the GDPR. You have the CCPA coming out of California. There's a lot of big sort of, um, you know, jurisdictions which are implementing quite, um, 
regimented data privacy regulations, but actually AI regulation has not really kind of caught up and a lot of legislatures are still looking at it. They're introducing online safety kind of regulations and that sort of thing. But really, um, you know, we're still, still a number of years behind meaningful AI regulation coming into place. But what's really being looked at is, you know, how transparent the AI is, how transparent the data is that is being collected, um, the complexity around the data and, and the kind of um, problem that it's trying to solve, and whether there is any sort of unfair bias that's sort of built into the technology. And a good example of that, which, which is often uh, one, and I don't know if anyone um, is able to prove this on Google, but often if you, you know, if you type in the word doctors, you may get a result of men in white jackets. And if you type in nurses, you might get women wearing white coats. You know, so there's this sort of unfair bias sort of thing that's sort of built in. Now, a lot of regulation is going to start to try and, you know, uh, you know put provisions in place to avoid that happening. <clears throat> Uh, but, but it's really the key consideration now for people using AI tools. Yes, we want to drive sales. Yes, we want to make um, the customer experience more streamlined. But are we missing out a whole piece of, of, of what we're doing by doing product suggestions or um, you know, automated responses, which are actually done in an unfair or biased way or not particularly transparent? So if you are looking to implement AI, or um, whether that's building or whether you're licensing or deploying it in, there are a couple of things that I would suggest. And they're sort of really looking at your own governance process internally. So, you know, how do you manage complex data? What's your risk appetite to that sort of data? Um, is it sort of privacy by design? So these are some, you know, concepts where a fashion business might be thinking about what data you know do you actually need in order to to deploy that ai don't be collecting more data than you need if you are collecting and processing data on what lawful basis are you doing that do you need consent is it a contract is there legitimate interest and obviously the really big one at the moment is security everyone's paranoid about um data breaches quite rightly so security you know implementing um you know correct checks and balances around all of that sort of stuff is really, really important. Um, <clears throat> the other key issue that's arising a lot legally with, with AI at the moment is IP. And you'll notice through the other two themes, through NFTs and wearables, there is a common theme here, and it's, a, it's IP and data really come to the heart of fashion tech. Um, but anyway, AI, um, uh, you know, the issues with um, IP ownership here um, really come down to that sort of, you know, um, who owns kind of what is created by the AI. And I'm not talking here about the underlying technology, because we know that in, in most cases that will have been developed by the developer um, that might be protectable by copyright or it might be protectable by patents. Some jurisdictions you can get patents for software. But really what I'm talking about is the output of the AI. So to take a really basic example, if you have a virtual fashion experience and you start sort of building an avatar and then the AI takes over and it suggests you should be wearing this or that or makeup should be this color or that color, what you're starting to, to, to do is really create a sort of like arguably a sort of copyright work. But the law typically it only gives copyright protection um, to an author of a work and that author typically has to be a human a real person so there is this kind of question being raised about what's the output of that and and, and who owns it and is it actually protectable and that then leads on to the follow-up question with ip well actually if there isn't much human input into what is being created what then happens if it ends up being infringing so if what the AI is creating is infringing of a third party IP, but you don't own it and you didn't have any say in its output, are you then liable for what's being created? Um, there's lots of ways of, you know, cutting that, thinking about that, maybe putting in protections against it. But it's it's something that I think is part of that AI governance process that businesses should be looking at. It's something to really sort of bear in mind. Um, <clears throat> right now on to... Um, 
wearable tech and fabric, which is the sort of second kind of trend that I, that I wanted to talk about. And again, like AI, wearable tech is not new. We all know that, but it obviously keeps continuing to shift the fashion tech landscape. Um, you know, brands are investing big time in the metaverse, as I've gave that example of Gucci and, and everything. But actually, as consumers, typically most of us still want to own real tangible products, whether that's clothing. Um, but, you know, when we're talking about fashion tech, it's really um, extending to sort of smart watches, smart glasses, smart materials. And, you know, we are still humans at the end of the day. We need to own these things. We need to buy them. So there is continued sort of development um, in this space. And a lot of big brands, including, um, you know, more sort of, um, uh, you know, brands like H&M, you know, are still going down that route of spending a lot of money actually in, in wearables. So, you know, during the, during the start of the pandemic, they partnered with a company called Boltware, which um, created a denim jacket that basically could give you a hug, you know, when you weren't allowed to hug anyone. Now, of course, the demand for that was not big enough to turn that into any form of meaningful, you know, around the world, we could all walk into an H&M and buy one of these things. But it, it sort of shows you that actually these big, big retailers even are sort of actually investing quite a lot of money into technology, even when they working, even when the brand is quite sort of a fast moving, you know, low cost sort of uh, product. Um, and of course, wearable technology is really important in, in the luxury retail space because you're trying to build, you know, a sort of um, a community and, and that digital platform, whether that's an app via your smartwatch um, or, or some other wearable to really start increasing and, and, and retaining customer engagement is a really, really large part. But again, the legal challenges that are really sort of prominent at the moment in, in the wearable space are again, IP and data. So <clears throat> when we, um, you know, when, when we look at sort of um, physical or, or new products, we start to think, you know, and this is not, not tangible software, we're talking about a real product. We know that patent protection is probably one of the best ways of, of protecting the underlying technology. You might have design right or copyright protection in, in perhaps, say, the way that the Apple Watch looks. But actually, it's the patent protection underneath that is, is probably really key in this case. Um, and that is becoming more and more prevalent, particularly with sort of modern fabric. So there's lots of sort of new leathers being made, mushroom leather, all of this sort of stuff. A lot of brands are investing a lot of money um, in, in sort of patterning their kind of technology here, because the way that the way that they see it sort of playing out is actually fashion businesses will be moving into a bit more of this B2B space. They're very good. They've got a B2C consumer market, but actually if they can build and own some technology like a mushroom leather, they start becoming a distrib distributor and a supplier to other brands. Um, the downside, obviously, with patent protection, as some of you might know on, on, the, on the webinar, it's very expensive and it's very uncertain. Um, it takes uh, a lot of very smart people to come together to try and you know, figure out what is protectable and what isn't. Uh, but, you know, it's something that's really should be should be considered. Um, <clears throat> I also um, want to just quickly cover cover off brand collaborations in wearables. So you do see a lot of collaborations, which, are you know, collaborations have never been more prominent in the fashion space. Um, and they are really prominent in the in the in the wearable space. Uh, but Obviously, when you're dealing with quite sophisticated technology, you do need to, to really uh, bottom out the contractual relationship uh, between the collab, between the sort of the brand tie up. So who owns the technology? Who owns the brand? What are you both bringing to the pie? Who then and how do you then share in the kind of revenue from it? Um, and like I say, none of this is sort of new, but because of the prominence of these kind of deals at the moment, these are really quite hot issues that are definitely coming across my desk. The final um, fashion tech bit that I wanted to cover is of course NFTs. Um, you must probably be living under a rock if you haven't um, come across them. 
Um, so I don't really intend to going in explaining what they are, but if people have questions about them, we, we can definitely we can definitely do that. Um, <clears throat> now, you know, these are to us, I would imagine most of us on the call, NFTs are relatively new, but they have actually been around since 2012. And they've been used a lot in the gaming space, in the video game space. Um, now, I think one of the big questions that people are asking a lot at the moment is really, you know, do NFTs or will they have a significant impact on the fashion world? And I started my little talk um, saying that, you know, we can't ignore any of this. Uh, you know, it, everything is kind of in play here. We've got to, we've got to keep, um, you know, we've got to keep moving with the times and, and, and do everything. When it comes to NFTs, I am still, the jury is out for me. I, I, there is a lot of hype on them um, and they are no, undoubtedly, you know, causing a lot of change, um, you know, but, um, and, you know, this is a really big, but they are hugely important in supporting marketing efforts for brands and really helping artists, designers, and creators to kind of reclaim their IP rights. And there have been a number of sort of famous cases at the moment where you are seeing, I'll say cases, rather deals where, um, you, you know, the, the sort of IP is being minted into an NFT and then you could, you know, and it's sold for a price. That IP is then sort of disappearing from the internet, whether that's YouTube or, or wherever, because actually the IP owners feel like they've now got control through the blockchain of ownership of that kind of IP asset. And all of us, you know, as IP lawyers, and, and some of you are probably IP lawyers on the call as well, will know that actually that kind of, you know, misuse of IP on the internet is, is um, really, really difficult to police. So NFTs are playing a really active role actually in that kind of, um, in, in sort of preventing uh, misuse of IP. Um, <clears throat> now, I don't think that brands are just jumping on the NFT bound wagon here. I think actually there's a lot of Gen Z um, sort of influence that's gone into this. And a lot of brands, as we know, are doing tie-ups with video game companies, Gucci, Burberry, Louis Vuitton, I think Balenciaga, you know, whether it's stuff with Fortnite or I mentioned Roblox, there's, you know, lots and lots of game deals are happening at the moment. And the big fashion houses know and, and want to attract that Gen Z buyer. They know that Gen Z are playing video games. Video games is one of, you know, the fastest growing media entertainment kind of segments going, you know, this is like, you know, um, this is a, a wonderful convergence here um, of, of opportunity. So, you know, this is, this is not going away the NFT world, but it is, um, unfortunately, legally, it is quite complicated. Um, again, the, the key watch outs really for me at the moment really are on IP and data. And actually IP in particular is, is complicated with NFTs. I think some people don't appreciate uh, the complexity of, of what an NFT actually is. And it is layered like any piece of artwork or any kind of um, creative thing. It's layered with lots and lots of different copyright. So you might have the original owner of the artwork that is then minted into an NFT. So you've got a sort of perhaps a copyright in an image. But in order to turn that image into an NFT, there's lots of code is then created in the background. Someone will own that code. That's a copyright work in itself. If the artwork is then synced with music, you've got music issues, whatever. It's no different to a complex advert or a film or, or piece of music. There are lots and lots of different rights holders. So in order to sort of mint an NFT, you need to make sure you've got all the rights in place. And then when you sort of, when the NFT is then sold or auctioned via a platform, all the platform terms that some are quite harmonized, but lots are different. Some will retain the IP, some will transfer copyright. Um, it all can get a little bit complicated. Um, and so really understanding what it is and, and what your IP position is and what you're actually, what the terms that you're putting the NFT on sale for are really, really important. Um, as we know, one of the key benefits of NFTs is all of this kind of smart contract process. So you're creating a blockchain record every time 
the NFT is sold or resold. And that obviously from an IP point of view is really helpful because it drives back this, uh, th this understanding that the original rights holder knows where that NFT is, where it's being used, where their artwork is being exploited. And that's a really, really fundamental piece. And that's why we are seeing this driver back to um, NFTs being used to help IP owners recover assets and kind of police them in, in a way. The final point that I want to mention on, on NFTs, and this is kind of unique to the UK, but there is current discussions about whether an NFT constitutes a security token. And when I say security token, that then brings us into the realms of financial regulation and money laundering and lots of all of that messy stuff, which, as we all know, governments around the world are panicking about cryptocurrency and uh, regulation and all of that sort of stuff. Um, that kind of that's that brings an end to, the, to to those three things. So I just sort of mentioned briefly about AI, wearables, and um, NFTs. And long story short, the issues or the things that are common with all of those are IP and and data. And I think if you take away anything from the legal side from me today, it's think about those two those two issues. Really incredible, Alan. Yeah, technology in, in every field and, and fashion, for, of course, is no different. Uh, pushes for new approaches to the law. Uh, and thank you so much. I mean, uh, I do think that AI, wearable, and NFT, they share this common legal issues as to IP and, and data. And uh, at the end of the day, a lot of work for lawyers, uh, some headaches for, for business, uh, business people, but uh, we'll of course, uh, find ways for them to to keep profiting from from technology in this in this view. Thank you, thank you very much for for your great input here. And moving on to the last presentation, and pausing again for a moment to to encourage the audience to uh, engage in the chat, send uh, questions for us to to address after the following presentation. So I will turn to to Jaji, who will introduce. Uh, some data regarding uh, the Brazilian fashion industry and examples of uses of the technology by Brazilian companies and businesses. So, Jaji, please, uh, please take over. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, everyone who's joining us in our webinar regarding the impacts of technology in the fashion industry. Uh, so, first of all, I'm going to I'm going to put some inputs uh, on an overview of the Brazilian fashion industry and some numbers uh, regarding the importance of the fashion business in Brazil. So first of all, as you can see, uh, Brazil uh, is one of the world's fifth larger textile manufacturer in the clothing producer in the world and has a domestic value of our fashion industry around $49 billion. And also uh, regarding the technologies in Brazil, we have an exponential growth in e-commerce sales. And a recent research also made by Ibit and Nielsen has shown that the online sales in Brazil have grown 31% in comparison to 2020. So we have around uh, 42 million of people buying uh, clothes and products through e-commerce. And from that number, 6.2 million people people are new users uh, in e-commerce. And also Brazil produces over 9 billion of clothing uh, items per year. So based on that numbers, uh, you can see that Brazil uh, has uh, impact in the worldwide industry regarding uh, fashion and technology is very present in the Brazilian fashion industry and the numbers are rap rapidly increasing over the years. So, and also uh, Brazil is one of the largest markets of main social media sites and mobile apps and games. So uh, you can see the relevance of Brazil in this industry. And now I'm going to provide some, some practical cases regarding some Brazilian companies uh, that have developed some technologies in the, the fashion industry. So first of all, we have the example of Boticário. 
which is a Brazilian cosmetics company that not only was the, the first Brazilian company to use uh, augmented reality from YouTube in its products, but also develop a, developed a partnership with Avakin Life to have a shop in this game. So the consumers will, will be able to have uh, these the simulated uh, shop, especially in the, the COVID situation. So the, the customers will have the experience like they were buying an online Boticario shop and simulate in the game and have an experience with the Boticario's attendant and digital consultant. And also uh, consumers could buy products from the portfolio Boticario itself. Another example of the fashion industry and digital market in Brazil is the, the example of digital coding. So we have this partnership with Lucas Leon and he made the, a collection with Shop Together to produce all digital clothing uh, that you can only use in online platforms and they were 100% digital. So he was the first uh, Brazilian designer to develop this kind of clothing. Also, we have the example of blockchain that is mainly used in the, the sustainable supply of chain to trace back the cotton that is uh, produced from the harvest through the, the, the sales. So the, the consumer will know uh, who he is buying from and if that product is sustainable. So uh, the main examples of blockchain uh, we can see in Brazil is to, to trace the supply chain in sustainability. sustainability. And also uh, blockchain is, it's currently used to uh, identify the authenticity of products in some cases as well, especially in the secondhand marketing of luxury goods. And finally, uh, we have uh, Avayanas, which is a Brazilian uh, shoe company that uh, developed a collection uh, along with a Brazilian uh, stylist and he, that produced the first collection of NFTs in Brazil. So we already, uh, you, as you can see, Brazil is already uh, update, uh, it's updated in this, these discussions and the, the digital uh, impacts and technology in its use in, it in, in our country as well, in our Brazilian companies. So now I'm gonna get back to Vanessa and she will talk about some of the impacts of technology and the law in Brazil. Thank you, thank you, Jaji. And as you all must be aware by now, and because Jaji just highlighted, right? The fashion industry in Brazil is of course one of the largest ones in the world. And its relevance is of course uh, undeniable with an even greater relevance considering the potential of the market that we have here yet to be uh, explored, I would say. So it goes without saying and then that uh, the legal implications arising from the increased use of technology by fashion brands, and, and as Ellen has uh, anticipated brilliantly in, in a much better way that I will certainly do here, they are uh, undisputable. And so uh, I, we decided to, to highlight four key implications in this, uh, in this slide here, which we are already experimenting or that we had some contact already here uh, in Brazil for Brazilian uh, fashion brands or even for clients experiencing uh, those, uh, those issues or uh, requiring our expertise to assist them on those issues in, uh, in Brazil. The first one we just uh, uh, indicated as like live streaming, but it goes, very much uh, in the same fashion as the the experience that Ellen told us about uh, regarding the red carpet experience for for Gucci. So uh, we know, of course, that perhaps one of the most innovative technologies available to fashion brands are augmented reality and virtual reality, and uh, an increasing number of of uh, fashion brands, right? are using those kinds uh, of technologies during fashion shows, for instance, to kind of like enhance the, uh, the experience, the loyalty to the brand or that uh, desirability, right, for, for that particular brand. And as this continues to be a growing trend, uh, we need to be careful. And as Alan uh, pointed out, uh, 
if, for instance, individuals and certain images are being captured at that moment, and then we need to, uh, for instance, seek appropriate releases from, from those people so we won't have like image rights issues there, or even if you are just like um, uh, showing right works that can be protected otherwise by, uh, by IP, just to make sure that your business is safe from this side when you're using, for instance, right, augmented reality or virtual reality in fashion uh, events. Another key aspect, and uh, I totally second uh, Alan's opinion on this, is IP, uh, technology implications uh, on the fashion industry challenge, general concepts of, of IP law, who is the creator of uh, AI generated works. Uh, if, for instance, uh, whether copyright applies, for instance, when details of the work are only uncovered if you use technology. So if you are using like augmented reality or virtual reality to actually uncover detail of the work, it's not complete right to the to the to the eye if you do not use uh, technology. That's uh, another issue for for IP as well. And of course, a bunch of other licensing uh, implications and F NFT. Uh, there's a big issue here as well, right? Because people tend to think that, oh, it's just a matter of releasing the NFT and making money out of it and forget to talk about the legal aspects before uh, you can actually do that with a, with a certain degree of uh, legal certainty and, and, and security, right? And uh, another big thing, of course, is, is the licensing implications here. So in other words, you need to make sure, right, that the work you wish to use is properly licensed to you, for, for example. Uh, another key aspect, uh, and we already have this uh, in Brazil, especially because we have recently enacted the Brazilian data protection law. It became enforceable last year with sanctions uh, applied as of August uh, 2021. So it's, it's still recent, but a lot of uh, companies are still struggling in how to, to comply with the regulation. And, and here, of course, the fashion industry will have to, uh, to comply with those, with those norms and seek alternatives. Uh, as technology, of course, is being more and more used to understand consumers, to create products, uh, customize it, right, to, to, to a certain group of individuals or for an individual. Uh, and uh, there's this increase in demand for personalized ways to bring shopping experience to, 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 ex to consumers, I guess, that the greater uh, are the impacts to, to, to the privacy of uh, data subjects. So if we take uh, wearables as an example, which was already given here, or uh, body scans like uh, fabric, this super high tech uh, fabrics are able to, to scan your body or try on uh, at home methods. They are all heavily, they all heavily rely, right, on, on the use of data and then uh, it follows that they will require that the companies develop or embed that their solutions, their products, their services with security and with, uh, with privacy mechanisms and also to create uh, creative ways to, to notify data subjects about the processing and how to be transparent about the processing uh, activities being carried out. And of course, to develop alternative to, to collect consent, which is a, a big issue, even though we know we have other legal basis for, for processing of, of data. And last, just to, to point out here, is more issue on, on safety. Brazil's are very heavy on like uh, consumer consumer law and other like uh, regulatory regulations for you to be able to actually release a product to, to the market. So it's uh, utterly important that companies pay attention to the regulations here. They get cleared from uh, regulatory bodies before they actually release certain types of products in the market. And they, they are able to, to provide right a chain of, uh, of supply in which the consumer is able to get assistance assistance for that product in a reasonable uh, manner as well. And this is, uh, this is something of course that we lawyers are already uh, experiencing here in, in Brazil. And uh, this is also, and this is, uh, this is something that we worth it, it was important to mention to bring to your attention 
because this is this feeling has just been uh, confirmed right by a research issued by by Mike Kinsey, which is on the next uh, slides that we bought here that we, we brought to you, uh, which presents kind of like the the future right for the for the for the fashion especially the future for fashion in 2022 it is a study that has just been released december uh december 1st in a partnership uh, between mckenzie and uh, a fashion institute and there they show like 10 big things across uh the tech, the, the fashion industry, and from that research, it's it's pretty clear how technology is impacting and how much uh, relevance it will play from now on into this uh, into this field. And, and just to to mention a few of them, right? We have the uh, the idea of use like blockchain for for the logistics of the fashion industry, and also to assert the right that uh, a given product, especially. Uh, luxury products you can uh, confirm the source of that of that product uh also like the the whole thing about the the metaverse and the and the digital uh and everything so this is uh, a tendency that has been highlighted by mckinsey as well and on the on the next slides as as uh they they mention uh the impact on social shopping right the influencers uh and, and and the whole business of getting influenced or, or retaining the influence right to to generate consumers to a certain uh to a brand or to drive consumers towards a particular brand all the issues as to security because the industry is perceiving as the industry uses more and more data they notice of course the need to to make sure that they have security methods, right, to protect that data, and at the end of the day, right now, to protect the business. So, yeah, I think it's a, uh, it's the implications are pretty clear. I think that from now on, we only have like an increase in the uh, in the amount of this exchange. A lot of work for uh, for lawyers and a lot of like creative spaces, right, for us to to come up with different solutions in the in this field. So I do hope that this, this was uh, very helpful, right? At least to, to start the conversation about the, the impacts uh, here and to touch base a little bit on the impacts here in, uh, in Brazil. I guess we may may uh, judge if you want to 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 go ahead with the first question for our panelists, please. Okay, so I have a question, and both Anastasia and Alan can both answer uh, as you please. Uh, what do you think that is the next big thing in fashion and technology? In terms of creativity, because I guess Alan will be far more. <laughs> important and congratulations Alan I was really really impressed I have to say um, I think the the way we will create for the future will definitely have the digital aspect into it you know we spoke about metaverse AI VR you know these are things that we cannot ignore I think that the essence of creativity the way it was in 10 years ago doesn't exist anymore the world is very portable and very mobile. So we might live in another city and we might work in another country and we might interact with four different nationalities simultaneously. I mean, our, our webinar today is the full example, you know? So I think that for the very near future, the, the analog way to create fashion is gonna, it's gonna disappear. I think it's gonna have very much to do with data, has very much to do with behavioral patterns, has very much to do with merchandising. And I do believe that fashion is going to be unfortunately very much dependent on marketing because the competition is going to be ruthless. Data is going to really infiltrate a lot the organic search we used to do in the past. Alan very successfully said, you know, is it human enough to have suggestions about your products than finding the products yourself online? And the truth is sometimes, you know, it's, it's uh, you save time. You know, you have a specific style, specific size, specific designers you like. So sometimes it helps when a newsletter comes over, you know, and you receive and you're like, oh, this is this is the pieces that I would buy anyway, because you know the algorithm has estimated uh, what would I buy. So I do think that technology is gonna 
surpass very much the analog way of doing research and creativity. Yeah, I couldn't actually add add any more to that. I completely agree. I think product product discovery through that those clever AI tools really is it's where brands retailers are, are sort of investing and should be investing um, with the interplay with social media as well and how that is actually you know a route to market. How powerful is Instagram for you and your shopping cart and getting you to to purchase products? Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, look, the big the big one is of course the metaverse and you know how that how that will will play out um, for fashion brands. But you know, Anastasius is right. You know, creativity is not what it was. So there is a there is a huge shift in in the fashion world. And what does a fashion house now look like? You know, it will be interesting to see what the creative directors of the big fashion houses are or what their backgrounds are in five, 10 years time from now, you know, are they going to be CTOs maybe? <laughs> <laughs> or maybe avatars, Alan. <laughs> yeah, or avatars, yeah. Very good. And more towards like, of course, uh, technology, I guess, introduces new players, right? To, to the fashion market. And I was just wondering whether, and maybe you, Alan, has been negotiating contracts for, for the industry, has seen any shift in, in bargaining power or in the negotiating negotiation settings because of the of, of like new players coming in because of the use of technology in the fashion industry. And also Anastasia, feel feel free to comment. Mm -hmm. I mean, on that bargain, on the sort of bargaining chip side, it is an interesting one. I mean, there are lots and lots of you know, big kind of e-commerce providers, route to market solution providers that we're all really aware of, you know, Shopify's, all those kind of, you know, they are very, very, very difficult to actually uh, negotiate against and have a sort of a bargaining, a bargaining chip. But um, <clears throat> I think brands are increasingly, you know, uh, more powerful, um, uh, you know, particularly, you know, fashion of all of the kind of retail uh industries fashion is the coolest it is the sexiest it does the most progressive stuff it always has i think it probably always will um and there is a, there is a lot of kudos and uh value that comes with that and you know technology providers do fall over themselves sometimes to get involved with fashion brands because it really can help position them and it can help you know highlight a story so yeah, I, you know, I'm seeing lots and lots of different deals uh, coming across my desk. Um, and, you know, they're not all valuable, but the, the, but the technology is still there. The technology is important and a lot of stuff is still um, exploratory. So people want a partner to explore to see if they can make it work. Can I add something there? Uh, I think the biggest question we have here has very much to do with the IP on a human scale first, because, you know, fashion has been benefited and suffering from copycats, from repetitive ideas that they are, you know, produce for mass market uh, audiences in the cheapest of the prices. I think what we're going to see here now is that the creative aspect when it comes to IP it's going to be a, a blend between an idea, a brand new proposition, and a possible uh, financial future. And this is how we're going to see, you know, the, the, the fashion of the future. Because imagine that at the moment, for example, there is this big fast fashion brand that comes from a very specific country, and they somehow in five years have surpassed the revenue that another fast fashion company has been doing for the last 40 years. And now what they do is they try to support young designers because they want to showcase that, you know, actually they are not just fast fashion copycats. They also support young designers and they're giving them a space to grow. While in reality, this is just the marketing ploy to showcase that they are next to these young designers. But of course, you know, these young designers will never be able to compete with the distribution, the manufacturing, you know, speed that the big companies are doing. So what is going to be the IP of fashion in the future? You know, who owns the little black dress? You know, because if this little black dress now is created in the metaverse, 
from a, I don't know, a interactive material uh, designed by a, I don't know, 16 year old somewhere in Madagascar, you know, who in the end is the owner of the little black dress? You know, it's very interesting to, to see how we're gonna go from the physical world to the digital world and who will have the ownership. So the NFT conversation, I find it extremely exciting, you know, us to eventually have an idea about who owns the rights of their original idea. Perfect, yeah. And now that we need to, to move on maybe to, to the end, right? I am extremely happy about this conversation. I think it's, uh, especially for the Brazilian audience, uh, it's very uh, much of a, a like a, to see the big picture, right? Of what's going on and what are the the insights for for two of the big names in this in this industry? So uh, I would like to thank you very much, Anastasius and Alan. It was such a great pleasure to have you uh, here in this project with us uh, today, uh, and to to give you like a few more minutes if you want to make any additional. Uh, remarks. Alan? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just say thank you for having me. I, I, there's probably lots of things I could say and I'll end up on a, going off on a tangent, but thank you for inviting me. Okay, thank you so much. I, I think it's very, very interesting. It's incredible that we got a little scoop inside the Brazilian fashion industry. And I think this is a great initiative that, you know, you ladies and, and your law firm uh, uh, made. And I'm very, very happy to be part of this exciting panel. So thank you as well. Thank you all very much. Thank everyone that, who was able to, to participate. And let's see if we have, Alan has already suggested the, the next uh, theme for, for an event. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's arrange for that in the future, right? Uh, have a lovely day, everyone. Thank you, you too. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, thank you.